Maybe, Mr. President, if you asked a woman who had been denied the help she needed to feed her children because you said you needed the money for a tax break for a millionaire or for a missile we couldn't afford to use. The worst thing Ronald Reagan did was to make the denial of compassion respectable. He said, you've worked hard. You've made your money. You shouldn't have to uh, feel guilty about refusing to throw it away on people who choose to be homeless and who choose not to work. That's what he said. He said it with an elegance and a kind of benign aspect that disguised its harshness. I think we can do anything about it. Well, why not? If we can work together now to look after the lives of the people here, I don't see why we couldn't work together afterwards to clear up the mess and help build a better world in which these things can't possibly happen. The qualities we've learned from comradeship and common suffering are not going to be wasted after this war. It's out of experience like ours that the new world will be built. That same idea of marshalling the collective force of the masses to challenge the entrenched power of wealth and business had also led the Labour Party to power in Britain after the war. But in the 80s, Labour, like the Democrats in America, lost election after election, as millions who had once voted for them switched their allegiance to the Conservatives. There it is, going blue just about everywhere, sweeping the country, the rural parts of Britain now gone blue. For they are the party of yesterday, and tomorrow is ours. In the face of this, a growing number within the Labour Party became convinced that if they were ever to regain power, Labour would have to come to terms with the new individualism. One of them was an advertising executive called Philip Gould, who had been a lifelong Labour supporter. Gould believed that Labour's leadership had become corrupted by the same patrician arrogance that dominated all Britain's institutions. They denigrated and disapproved of the new aspirations of working class voters. Labour stopped listening to these people. And I remember uh, the best example of this was after the election of 1983, which was the election above all, where the people's voices just were not heard. And I had dinner with a leading uh, Labour Party figure who'd been involved in the defeat, heavily devolved in, involved in the defeat, and his wife said, God, these working class people, these working class people, they just, you know, we give them education, we give them chances in life, what do they do? They read the sun and they just don't vote for us. And there was such a gap between these people just trying to make lives for themselves, better lives for themselves, and the kind of elitism of the Labour Party that was just such a chasm that, 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 that had to be filled. Gould became part of a small group of modernisers centred around Peter Mandelson. Their aim was to reconnect Labour with the lost voters. To do this, Gould turned to the technique he knew well from his work in advertising, the focus group. Gould commissioned focus groups in suburban areas across the country with small groups of voters who had switched to Mrs Thatcher. People were encouraged not to talk rationally about policies, but to express their underlying feelings. And what Gould discovered was a fundamental shift in people's relationship to politics. They no longer saw themselves as part of any group, but as individuals who could demand things from politicians in return for paying taxes, just as business had taught them to do as consumers. And I found that, that people had become consumers. People now wanted to have, you know, politics and life on their own terms. I mean, not just in politics, but in all aspects of life too. People see themselves as they are, as autonomous, powerful individuals who are entitled to be respected, who are entitled to have the best, not just in, um, you know, uh, going to, 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 to Tesco's or wherever, but the best in terms of health and in education too. All this was about getting the Labour Party to understand that people really, really, really had changed and the Labour Party had not, and unless the Labour Party changed, it would not win. Philip Gould now set out to try and persuade the Labour Party that they would have to make concessions to what he called the new aspirational classes. But he was going to face implacable opposition. In the run-up to the 1992 election, Gould argued that the only way to win was for Labour to promise not to put up taxes. 
But the Shadow Chancellor, John Smith, angrily refused. Labour would stick to its fundamental policies. They would fight the election with the promise of tax increases to create a fairer society. And as the campaign began, it seemed as if Philip Gould was wrong. The traditional polls consistently showed Labour ahead, despite the Conservative campaign message that a Labour government would put up taxes. Even the Conservatives' oldest allies in the press became convinced that by harping on about tax, the Conservatives were cutting their own throats. So the worry about the Tories must be that they're not, at the moment, conveying a sense of grip and being in control. And uh, unless they can do better than that, I think they're going to lose. But is, the other thing is that they still say that they are going to go on and on with this one single message of tax. And I think I mean, part of the difficulty this morning was that you had a whole lot of uh, people who'd been going to the same press conference for seven days, had virtually the same message yeah. thrust at them, and are, are kind of getting bored and restless and hitting back on it. I think the media sense a big story coming yeah. in the Tories being defeated. And the Labour Party, too, was convinced it would win and finally return to power. It's now time to meet the men and women who will form the next government. Labour Chancellor of Exchequer, John Smith. And now, it is time, time for the next Prime Minister, Neil Kinnock. Those running Labour's campaign believed that by modern presentation, they would attract back the voters, yet keep the old policies. But Philip Gould was convinced that Labour were going to lose. Through his focus groups, he knew that the very people who were telling the traditional pollsters they would vote Labour were in reality preparing to vote Conservative out of self-interest. But they were too embarrassed to admit it. And John Major also knew this, because his focus groups were telling him the same thing. Look at the poll which puts Labour five points ahead. Sir, it's one to the, the Daily Mail, sir. Feel out in the streets that matters. What are you uh, it's feeling good, feeling good on the streets. It is feeling good on the streets, yes. It has been feeling surprisingly good on the streets for some time. Quite surprisingly, quite out of line with uh, opinion polls. Don't ask me to explain it, but it feels all right. Sir? Anyway, go sir? on. No, lads, you must sit down. We're waiting to go. John Major's victory in 1992 was a disaster for the Labour Party. A small group of reformers, centred around Peter Mandelson and Philip Gould, were convinced that the only way for the party to survive was to change its basic policies. But their ideas were rejected by John Smith, who had now become leader. Philip Gould left Britain to go to work for the campaign to elect Bill Clinton president in America. The 1992 election during it and afterwards, people felt under great strain and really did feel demoralised and dejected. And then to go from this to the Clinton campaign, it was an extraordinary experience because here suddenly I found articulated many of the ideas that I'd had but not fully myself been able to encapsulate or to articulate. If you want a president who will restore the middle class, reclaim the future for the middle class, and restore the American dream, vote for Bill Clinton in New Hampshire and send a signal to the country that we are coming together. Thank what Gould discovered was that like the Labour Party, the Democrats had also been doing focus groups with swing voters. The difference was that Bill Clinton had decided to tailor his policies to fit with these voters' desires. Above all, with their ferocious belief that they should only pay tax for things that benefited them, not for the welfare of others. I have no idea what percentage of my tax dollars go to welfare, but uh, even if it's a minuscule percentage, you know, even if it's a quarter per a percent, you know, it's still too much for the people that are receiving these benefits that, that are basically non-productive. The Clinton team decided that to win, they had to promise tax cuts for these suburban voters. And they also used the focus groups throughout the campaign to check every appearance, speech and policy with them for their approval. What Clinton called the forgotten middle class became central figures in a new type of reactive...